Hello and welcome to another episode of Mastering Business Communications, the show which highlights District 29. Today, tonight, I am your host, Lovely Lal, and today with me is Lisa Feibelman from B2 Toastmasters. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, and how long have you been in Toastmasters? Lisa? I've been in Toastmasters four and a half years. Okay. okay. What made you join Toastmasters? I wanted to meet fellow county employees and also other people that are in the network of Toastmasters. Okay, so you are a county Toastmasters. Which county is that? Fairfax County, and we have a club that's 17 years old. Okay. We have members that are in the club 15 years. Wonderful. And we meet in the B2 building, which is called mm -hmm. the Parity Building at mm -hmm. 12055 Government Center Parkway, and we meet every other Thursday, and we have for 17 years. Oh, okay. So is it a lunchtime, lunchtime meeting? It's a 12 to a 1 club. Okay. Wonderful. So uh, what's the best part of Toastmasters for you so far? I've enjoyed contests. I've enjoyed being an area governor. I've enjoyed being a president. I've enjoyed... 50 speeches. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I've enjoyed the leadership opportunity. I've also enjoyed going to different clubs. Okay. There are so many mm -hmm. in our area. Could you tell us what's on the agenda tonight? We have two speeches. Hillary will be presenting, and we have Dennis mm -hmm. evaluating. I'm sorry, we have two speeches and two evaluations. Okay, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Uh, what else can you tell uh, about B2 Toastmasters, uh, which really intrigues people to join? One time we had our county executive visit because we were celebrating 15 years as a club, mm -hmm. and Tony Griffin at the time had come and said that if he had been a Toastmaster, he would have learned many skills mm -hmm. as a leader as well as a speaker that he could have taken at the county executive level mm -hmm. in that position, which would have served him well. Yeah. And I recently, um, uh, are you aware of that uh, Fairfax County got a corporate award? They received the corporate award for how they support their clubs? Yes, we use the government center for trainings, mm -hmm. and so we have a large number of Toastmasters visit and use the facilities. Mm -hmm. And I have attended a lot of those trainings at Fairfax County. They have a wonderful building to accommodate us, and they, have a big, uh, they are a big supporter. So. Uh, we had our international vice president visit uh, from Mohammad Murad from Toastmaster International, and he personally actually uh, uh, gave that corporate award to Fairfax County. And Ed Long, our current county executive, was the president. Okay. So I can't wait to hear the speeches today. Great. And let's see, and stay tuned. <laughs> gentlemen, Albert Einstein once said, it is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. Have you ever wondered how your life took a certain direction, why you're doing what you're doing, or perhaps why you're not doing something you'd always planned to do? For as long as I can remember, I had planned to be a teacher or an astronaut. And most people who knew me were convinced that I would become a teacher. It did, after all, seem to be the most logical of my choices. And so there I was, age 23, fresh out of graduate teacher training, and thrilled to be about to start my first teaching practice at a small village school in England. Now, it was a little strange that my first experience of teaching was to be with small children, when I had trained to teach adults. But I was confident that I knew everything there was to know about teaching. And since I had three younger brothers and sisters, what else was there to know about children? On that first day, I set off on my bicycle for the two mile ride to the school. Now my plan was to drive in uh, behind the school park my bike very discreetly, and run into the restroom to freshen up before meeting my class. However, as I approached the school, a small curly-headed boy leaned over the school wall, pointed at me, and shouted at the top of his voice, here comes Miss on a bicycle! Well, the entire school swarmed over to the gate, and in seconds I was besieged by kindergartners 
all pulling and pushing me and my bike towards my classroom. So much for my discreet arrival. Now, there were a few seconds of silence as the headmaster introduced me to my class. And I remember looking around thinking, oh, what a lovely class. Such angelic faces and so well behaved. And then the headmaster left the classroom. Now, what happened next is something of a blur and so fast that to this day, I have not really much idea of what happened. A small girl, about 10 years old, rushed up to me and shouted, what's wrong with your face? My hands instinctively flew to my face and I thought, oh, well, have I got a rash? Am I bleeding? But no, everything was still there and felt perfectly normal. So I said to her, what do you mean? That, she screeched, pointing at what I had convinced myself over the years was a fairly unobtrusive beauty spot on my chin. Oh, ah, well, that, I stuttered. It's nothing, and besides, you really shouldn't make personal comments. Ha, huh, she snorted. It makes you look like a witch. Well, by now, I was feeling about as self-conscious as you could possibly feel in front of a class of 30 small people, now all gazing intently at the new teacher who could possibly be a witch. My name's Diane said my nemesis. You can call me Daisy. Do you like peanuts? I have peanuts. I like peanuts. Do you have any peanuts? Um, no. Well, um, no, Daisy, uh, Diane. I like peanuts, but no, I don't have any peanuts. Now, would you please take a seat? I said in my most teacher-like voice. Well, she sat for a while. Now, this was my first ever experience of teaching. It was a class of four to 11-year-olds and I had imagined a lovely bonding time over a story. But my class had other ideas. Diane, alias Daisy, was now sitting with her arms folded, glaring at me, and poked out her tongue. A lovely little boy about four years old with a very sweet face started kicking his chair. Oh, don't do that, dear, I said calmly. Well. This added attention only encouraged the young man, who now continued to kick his chair much louder and much more rigorously. Diane, alias Daisy, now decided this was a very good time to start running around the classroom, knocking over everything in her path. Someone was shouting, someone was crying, someone was pulling someone's hair, and almost everybody was either singing, laughing, crying, scraping their chairs, or running around in circles. I looked up at the wall clock. It was 9.10. I was exactly five minutes into class time. I managed to struggle through the rest of the class by making Diane, alias Daisy, my assistant, a role she appeared to relish as she channeled her energies into handing out books and asking me a dozen questions a minute, usually on the topic of peanuts. The rest of the day passed in a muddle of mayhem and confusion, which I now realize no amount of teacher training could ever have prepared me for. I spent my time retrieving class projects from behind cupboards, shoe sandwiches and chewing gum from the top of cupboards, and small people from inside cupboards. There's a wonderful quotation by a gentleman called William Lyon Phelps, no doubt a gentleman of unusual perception with regard to the teaching profession. He said, the teacher should make a concerted effort never to lose his temper in the presence of the class. If a man, he may take refuge in profane soliloquies. If a woman, she may follow the example of one sweet-faced young tranquil girl who went out into the yard and gnawed a post. Well, fortunately, I never needed to gnaw a post. But it will come as no surprise that I never became a school teacher either. I felt I owed it to the teaching profession to leave it to those of a more robust disposition. But I will never forget my first day of teaching, the day that my life changed direction, nor will I forget Daisy Diane. And just a few weeks ago, I was cleaning out a cupboard and I came across a small pink envelope addressed to me almost 30 years ago. And there's a picture of a little astronaut on a rocket ship at the top. And it says, I hope you've enjoyed your two weeks at our school. I hope you can come again. I hope you like peanuts, because I will be sending you a packet. Love, Daisy Diane. Thank you.
every speech at the B2 Toasters meeting gets an evaluation. It's a regular part of our meeting where each speaker gets some feedback, some positive feedback on their speech and it hopefully motivates them to do their next speech. Hillary just gave a speech from the entertaining speaker manual. It's a five to seven minute speech that was supposed to highlight organization skills, descriptions, use an anecdote, and above all, be entertaining. I think Hillary met all those qualifications. Her story was based chronologically. It's a very easy way to organize a speech. I really liked her descriptions. I think anyone who's ever worked with children could really relate to them. We didn't hear a lot about what Daisy Diane, the antagonist of this story, looked like, but through Hillary's facial expressions and gestures, we really got a good idea of what she was like. I really like the way Hillary uses language. She's a rhetorical device, a triad in the speech. She always uses something. In this speech, she had things above the cupboard, behind the cupboard, and inside the cupboard. And that kind of repetition really hits home your speech. I thought there were a couple things that she could do a little bit differently. One thing I think she could have done is to pause every once in a while and let the audience soak into the story and really enjoy it a little bit more. The second thing is the conclusion could have been a little bit stronger. At the beginning, you, she started with a quote from Albert Einstein about choosing a career, and she didn't really get into that in the end, in the conclusion. I think it could have been a stronger speech had she tied the opening with the conclusion. In all, it was a very entertaining speech. I loved to hear about the children, and I thought the descriptions, the impersonations, and the gestures, and it was all wonderful. Thank you, Hillary. <laughs>100 people, numerous times, but I was never so nervous as I was facing this crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, this was not an ordinary day. On this day, I was no longer Brendan Ford. I was no longer Mr. Ford. On this day, I had become Coach Ford, and kneeling before me, on a cool spring afternoon were 10 six-year-olds waiting with bated breath as I was about to teach them the beautiful game. Now I can tell you that spring that I learned a lot from the pink flying super ninjas. First and foremost, I learned that six-year-olds don't apply logic as I tried to impress upon them that if we were flying ninjas, we were inherently super and we really didn't need that in our name. Coach Ford, we are the pink flying super ninjas. So be it. I learned that six-year-olds ask a lot of questions. Coach Ford, is there gonna be snack after practice? Coach Ford, can you help me tie my shoe? Coach Ford, is this gonna be fun? And I also learned that six-year-olds are blunt. Coach Ford, are you a good coach? Really? 10 minutes into my first practice and you're already questioning my coaching abilities? Well, Billy, your mother put you here. Clearly your no mother knows what's good for you, right? Coach Ford, my mother burnt the kitchen down last week. All right, Billy, we'll take your mom off of snack duty. I learned 15 seconds. 15 seconds. That is how long you get to explain something to a group of six-year-olds. 10 is better, but 15 is tops. If you're going to do a about, drill about dribbling, you don't pontificate on all the wonders of dribbling and all the good it's gonna do for the team. You merely say, get a ball, let's start dribbling. In this circle, in this square, everybody start dribbling. Growing up, I always knew I wanted to be a coach. Even as a teenager, I had envisioned someday that I would be coaching kids. 
And on that first day, one of my little players was, was not paying attention. And I thought, I will draw upon the experiences of my youth and do for him what my coaches did to get my attention. And so I said, Timmy, you're not paying attention. I want you to run to the end of this field and back as fast as you can. And Timmy shot up. Yes, sir, coach. And off he went. Immediately, every other hand went up. Coach Ford, how come Timmy gets to run to the end of the field? Coach Ford, are we all going to get to run to the end of the field? Coach Ford, are we going to get to run to the end of the field every day? What I had intended to be a punishment was perceived as a reward. OK, everybody run to the end of the field. Coach Ford needs to catch his thoughts. I kept coming back, though, to that question that I got the first day. Are you a good coach? And I didn't really know. But over the eight weeks that I had with the pink flying super ninjas, and I can say over that eight weeks, I probably learned more than I did in any semester in college. I learned one important thing about being a good coach. And being a good coach has nothing to do with winning. At the end of every practice, at the end of every game, at the end of every season, you really only need to ask your players one question. And that question is, did you have fun? If you can look at your players and you can ask them, did you have fun, and the answer is yes, then chances are you're a good coach. And chances are that the kids you're coaching will continue to play the sport you're coaching, and they'll always look at you as a positive role model in their life. So at the end of every practice, at the end of every game, at the end of every season, you simply ask your players, did you have fun? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we just heard a wonderful speech by Brendan Ford. He spoke from the Entertaining Speaker Manual, which is an advanced manual. He met the goals of the speech brilliantly, because the goal was to be entertaining, to use humor in an entertaining way to make his point. What was his point? Coaching six-year-olds is sometimes tougher than you think. But the real point was, make sure that your six-year-olds have fun. At the end of every game, did they have fun? Yes, they did. At the end of the season, did they have fun? Yes, they did. That was really good. The way you used your hands to be different children asking questions, that was really good. That helped move the speech along. It brought us into the speech. Doing that, I really enjoyed. Some of the things that I thought that you could have done, which I don't always recommend, would be the use of some props. You started out and you said, Coach Ford, a hat, which would have made you Coach Ford, maybe a whistle, maybe a clipboard, so that you could have diagrammed a play. Then, as you realized, that the attention span of six-year-olds is 10 seconds, maybe 15 if you stretch it, you would have de-evolved from Coach Ford, who's trying to explain what dribbling is, to Mr. Ford, who wants the children to have fun. The other thing I think you need to do, I understood the beautiful sport to be the beautiful sport. Both the Brazilians and the Italians refer to soccer as the beautiful sport. I think you could have mentioned it as being soccer. In summary, your hand gestures were really good. Your voice inflections were good. You used the humor appropriately and you moved the story along by involving yourself with the different characters. You could have used some props. Otherwise, I think your speech was very good. 
and you brought it all home to us in a humorous way. Hello and welcome back to our episode. What a wonderful uh, speeches we had. I enjoyed it. I think you have some very, very experienced Toastmasters, Diane. Oh, we do. I've enjoyed being a part of the club. They did a fantastic job. Very proud of them. Mm -hmm. By the way, we have the president of the club, the B2 Toastmasters, with us, Diane Hunter. And when did you join Toastmasters? I've been in for three years now, basically from my retirement till now. And it's been wonderful. You know, this is a wonderful subject that you joined after retirement. I would really like to know what inspired you to join. I've been public speaking all of my life since mm -hmm. I've been a little kid. And when I had an opportunity to come into B2 Toasters, I came in because I just wanted another part of my life to begin, but it had some hidden benefits. Okay, that's wonderful to hear that because I am uh, doing an outreach to communities over uh, for senior communities and I, would, I can really use your pointers later absolutely. on. We'll it's talk excellent. later. Yes. <laughs> but what a wonderful show it has been. And I think uh, our audience here and as well as at home uh, learned a lot what Toastmasters is all about and how uh, excellent it is to get a feedback, continued feedback, absolutely. because that's what improves us each time. So if you are interested in finding a Toastmasters club near you, please visit www.toastmasters.org or you can visit www.d29tm.org. That is our District 29 website. And speaking of District 29, we are having a spring conference coming up on May, May 3rd and May 4th. So a registration is open. And it's open for Toastmasters or non-Toastmasters -toast alike. Yes. Because we have wonderful sessions, educational sessions, as well as we have speech contests, international speech contests and evaluation contests. So please go to www.d29tm.org to register and find more about it. As well as we have quite a lot of opportunities to get involved for the clubs. We have a silent basket auction, gift basket auction, which we do every year. And I am the sponsorship chair for yes, that. Yes, I remember that. So <laughs> if your club is interested in promoting uh, themselves, so bring your baskets it, uh, it, and we will display them as well as it helps us offset the cost of the conference, as well as there are um, many other opportunities. So I, w I wish you join uh, and you also register. So um, I want to thank you for uh, initiating the process. Well, it was our pleasure. We've enjoyed it. Yeah, and I enjoyed uh, wonderful uh, speeches and evaluations. And could you tell us about your Toastmasters Club? How can people uh, join that one? Do you have well, a website? Yes, we do. We'd like to invite them to go to 9807.toastmastersclubs.org and we will be happy to receive them at our meetings. They can email me back and forth, be happy to talk to them. So when do you meet? We meet on payday Thursdays, twice a month. Okay, that's easy to remember. Yes, to pay. exactly. <laughs> Maybe I should come there and collect a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, I heard that it's a Fairfax County Government uh, Club. Yes, and it is. Is it an open club? It is an open club. We do embrace people from corporations around the area mm -hmm. or anybody in the Fairfax community that comes to our site that would like to join. We welcome them all. Oh, that's wonderful. I think a lot of people uh, join Toastmasters and it just changes their life, as you have Absolutely. seen. Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. So, so I want to thank you again, thank uh, you as well coming. as all your club members uh, who came and participated and made a wonderful show. And thank you for participating. And stay tuned for next time. Uh, tonight with a uh, little joke. Uh, this guy, he's a farmer. He says, hey. Hello? I'm sorry. But see, seriously, folks. Um, uh, Speaking in public is no joke. Doc, farmer says, a uh, doctor says, f chicken says. For help, call Toastmasters, the public speaking support group. <laughs> the chicken. 